بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Last week we spoke about the expulsion of one of the tribes of the Jews and the name of that tribe was Banu Qaynuqa we spoke about their exile and their expulsion from Al Madina and we spoke about the incident that happened shortly after the battle of Badr where a woman from the Muslims went to buy some gold from one of the shops that was owned by a Jewish goldsmith from Banu Qaynuqa and the Jews around that marketplace they harassed this woman and the goldsmith actually tied her dress so that when she got up to leave she became exposed and she screamed and a Muslim man heard this scream and he attacked the goldsmith who humiliated her in this way and he killed him and then the fellow Jews the friends of that goldsmith who were in that area they saw the Muslim killed the goldsmith so they went and they attacked him and they killed that Muslim so when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam demanded from Banu Qaynuqa that they surrender those murderers to him they refused so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confronted them with the Muslim army and they became so afraid that without even fighting they surrendered themselves and their punishment was that they were to be exiled from Al Madina so they all left Al Madina and they went to Asham so this is one of the incidents that happened shortly after the battle of Badr and as we mentioned the Jews of Al Madina they were subdivided into three different tribes there was Banu Qaynuqa, there was Banu Nadir, and there was Banu Qurayza. So these three tribes of Jews, they each inhabited their own part of the city. So now Banu Qaynuqa is gone. They're out of the picture. So now there are only two tribes of Jews remaining in Al Madina. And that, uh, uh, those tribes are Banu Nadir and Banu Qurayza. So after Banu Qaynuqa was expelled from Al Madina, the Jews from these other two tribes, they became nervous and they became worried as well that something similar might happen to them as well. So they started to, they continued to live there in Al Madina, but they started to become nervous and they started to become worried because they didn't know what was going to happen to them in the future. So after the Battle of Badr, the Muslims' prestige and their honor and their respect was getting higher and higher. So because of this, the number of munafiqeen, the number of hypocrites increased. Because there were people who were openly disbelievers before the Battle of Badr. They were openly disbelievers. But after the Battle of Badr and after seeing the Muslims gaining in prestige and honor and respect, a number of these disbelievers, they thought that they could ride on the back of that new respect and honor that the Muslims had. So they thought that we will pretend to become Muslims so that we can share that prestige and that honor that the Muslims now have. But in their hearts, <coughs> in their hearts they were still disbelievers. So this is the essence of nifaq. This is hypocrisy. To outwardly show that you are a believer when in reality in your heart you conceal your disbelief. So the number of munafiqeen increased after the battle of Badr because that they, they thought that by pretending to be Muslims they could have the advantages and the respect and the pre prestige that the Muslims were now enjoying. So because of the increase in the number of hypocrites the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba they had to deal with a lot of plotting they had to deal with a lot of cunning type of plans that the hypocrites would concoct they had to deal with different types of conspiracies and alliances of evil.
they had to be on the lookout for all of these things because there were people from within the community that were trying to destroy Islam from the inside. So this is something that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions had to be very, very alert about. So the Battle of Badr, as we mentioned, it took place in the month of Ramadan in the second year of the Hijrah. So Ramadan in the year two of the Hijrah. The next major battle happened a little more than a year after that. In the month of Shawwal, in the year three of Hijrah, was the battle of Uhud. So there was about a year between the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud. But during this year, during this time between the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud, between these two major battles, there were a number of minor incidents that took place in Medina. And one of these events we spoke about last week, and that was the expulsion of the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa, that happened shortly after the Battle of Badr. Another incident that happened between Badr and Uhud was a battle known as Ghazwat al Sawiq. A battle known as Ghazwat as sawiq the expedition of as sawiq and what is as sawiq as sawiq is actually a type of date a type of date that grows in al madina and the reason why this battle was named after this type of date ghazwat as sawiq is because of the story that took place during this battle so as we know the main leaders of the Quraysh, they were all killed during the Battle of Badr. Abu Jahl was killed. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah was killed. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt was killed. All of the elders of the Quraysh, the elder VIP leaders of the Quraysh, they were all killed. Except for Abu Sufyan, because Abu Sufyan was able to evade the Muslim army with his caravan and reach Mecca. So Abu Sufyan actually didn't even take place, didn't even take part in the Battle of Badr. Rather, he and his caravan were able to evade the Muslim army and they returned to Mecca. So Abu Sufyan now, he's the only VIP leader of the Quraysh that is left. So he became the undisputed leader of the Quraysh in Mecca. So now Abu Sufyan is the head of the Quraysh because all of the other leaders are dead. So Abu Sufyan, he made a vow, he took an oath that he would not take a bath, that he would not put on any type of scent or perfume, that he would not approach his wives until he took some revenge upon the Muslims for what they did to the Quraysh on the day of Badr. So he took this oath and he made a vow upon himself that he would get revenge. So in order to fulfill this vow, Abu Sufyan secretly arranged for a small army to accompany him from Mecca to al Madina, about three months after the Battle of Badr. So as we mentioned, the Battle of Badr took place in the month of Ramadan. So about three months later, it was the month of Dhul Hijjah. And Abu Sufyan and a small army from Mecca they leave Mecca and they go towards al Madina. When they reach the outskirts of al Madina, they want to formulate a plan as to what would be the best way to infiltrate the security of Medina. The Prophet ﷺ and his Sahaba, they know that there are a lot of threats from outside. So they make sure that they keep Medina secure. They're very careful about this. And they're very diligent about the security of al Madina, Because they know they have many enemies. So Abu Sufyan, he didn't want to just make a random attack on al Madina, Because he knew that it would be very unlikely that they would be successful in doing such a thing. So he wanted to find a way to infiltrate al Madina from a weak point. A point that maybe isn't very heavily secure. That isn't very heavily guarded. So when he reached the outskirts of al Madina with his army, he decided to try to make an alliance with the Jews. 
And even though these Jews had a treaty with the Prophet ﷺ that they would not partake in any type of activities against the Muslims, the Jews, they were always known as people who don't honor their commitments. They can make whatever treaty you want them to make and the next day they will betray that treaty. This was the history of, of the Jewish people. And it is still the history of the Zionists of today. They still follow that same example. So they were known as people of treachery and they were known as people of betrayal. And Abu Sufyan, he decided to take advantage of that. So he approached one of the leaders of the tribe of Banu Nadir. As we mentioned, Medina had three tribes of Jews. Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir, and Banu Quraidha. Now Banu Qaynuqa, they're out of the picture. They're gone. They have been exiled. So now there are only two tribes left of Jews in Al-Madinah, Banu Nadir and Banu Quraidha. So Abu Sufyan, he approaches one of the leaders of Banu Nadir by the name of Huyay ibn Akhtab. And we spoke about Huyay ibn Akhtab before. When the Prophet ﷺ first entered al Madina, Huyay ibn Akhtab, he actually went to meet the Prophet ﷺ and to hear him speak. And after he heard him speak, and he went back to his people, Huyay's brother, Abu Yasir, asked Huyay, what do you think of him? What do you think about Muhammad? And Huyay answered, Wallahi, he is the one, he is the Prophet that is mentioned in the Torah. He is the Prophet that has been prophesized in the previous scriptures. Wallahi, it is him for sure. So then Abu Yasir said, so what, what should we do? What are you going to do about this? And Huye said, Wallahi, I will be his enemy forever. I will be his enemy forever. So even though he knew for sure that this is the messenger that was mentioned in the Torah, this is the one that they had been waiting for, even with that knowledge, he said, I will be his enemy forever. And the reason that these Jews had so much enmity towards the Prophet wasallam, even though they knew that he was the messenger of Allah, is because they were jealous that he did not come from Bani Israel like the previous prophets had come. He did not come from the progeny of Ishaq salam. Rather, he came from the progeny of Ismail salam. And because of that, they were jealous and they refused to accept him even after knowing that he was definitely the messenger of Allah. So Huyay ibn Akhtab, he is one of the leaders of the tribe of Banu Nadir. Abu Sufyan approached him to get inside information about Medina. Where should we attack? When should we attack? What would be the best strategy for infiltrating al Madina? He tried to get this information from Huyay ibn Akhtab. But Huyay ibn Akhtab, he was afraid to help Abu Sufyan because he just saw what happened to Banu Qaynuqa and how they were exiled from al Madina. So he feared that if he helped Abu Sufyan and if the Muslims found out about it, that maybe the same fate that happened to Banu Qaynuqa would also happen to his tribe, Banu Nadir. So he, out of this fear, he refused to help Abu Sufyan. But Abu Sufyan didn't give up so easily. He went to another leader from Banu Nadir. And this man was a Jew named Salam ibn Mishkam. And Salam agreed to help Abu Sufyan. He agreed to help Abu Sufyan. He told him about the different points in Medina and he told him about the places that were not as heavily secure and not as heavily guarded. So he basically gave him a strategy and he gave him a plan on where and when to attack al Madina. So Salam ibn Mishkam, this leader from Banu Nadir, he betrayed the agreement that had been made with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they would not participate in any activities against the Muslims. He betrayed that treaty and he betrayed that agreement and he helped Abu Sufyan. So Abu Sufyan, with this new information that he had, had gathered, he sent in his army to a weak point in al Madina, And that was an area where there were some farms and it wasn't very heavily guarded by people. So Abu Sufyan sent his army into this part of the city and they entered one of those farms and this was a farm that had date trees and the dates that were growing here were known as a sawiq 
a type of date known as Sawiq. So there were two people in that particular farm at that time. One of the, one of the men from the Ansar and a helper of his. They were, they were in the farm at that time, in the date farm, when Abu Sufyan and his army entered. So when they entered, these two men were caught off guard and Abu Sufyan's army, they killed both of them. So this Ansari man and his, and his companion, they were both killed in this date farm. And Abu Sufyan's army, they started to gather as many dates as they could to take back with them. So the commotion was heard by some of the people around. When this man and his companion were killed in the garden, there was some noise that was made and some of the people, they heard it. So they went back quickly to the Prophet ﷺ and they, they told him, Ya Rasulullah, something happened in this garden. We heard some commotion and we heard a scream. So the Prophet ﷺ, he quickly went with a number of his companions to investigate what had happened. And when they went to the farm, they saw these two dead bodies there. So the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, they immediately started a pursuit of Abu Sufyan. By this time, Abu Sufyan and his men, they had fled. And Abu Sufyan, by killing these two people, he felt that he had fulfilled his vow. He vowed that he would take some revenge for what happened to the Quraysh on the day of Badr. Okay, he came into Medina, he killed two people. That is at least a partial revenge. So he felt by doing this that he had fulfilled his vow and he headed back towards Mecca with his army. So the Prophet ﷺ and his companions after finding out what had happened, they started to pursue Abu Sufyan and his army. But Abu Sufyan and his army had gotten a pretty big head start. But there was one problem for Abu Sufyan and his army. The fact that they had taken so many of those sawiq dates from that farm. It became heavy upon their animals. So it was slowing the animals down. So the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were starting to catch up with them somewhat. So in order to speed up so that they wouldn't be caught by the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim army, they started to throw those dates down. As they were moving along, they would throw the dates so that they would lighten their load and they would be able to go faster. So they kept throwing the dates. So the Prophet ﷺ, he chased them for five days, but they were too far ahead and he was not able to catch up with them. So the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim army, they returned back to al Madina. They returned back to al Madina, And this expedition was known as Ghazwat as sawiq the Battle of as sawiq Also from the events that took place between the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Uhud was the death of one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ a companion by the name of Uthman ibn Mad'oon radiallahu an. He was one of the great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was nicknamed as Farisun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The knight of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he was a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he passed away in that year between the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud. When Uthman ibn Mad'oon radiallahu an passed away, the Prophet ﷺ ordered that he should be buried in a piece of land that was known as Baqi' al-Gharqad. And the Prophet ﷺ selected this piece of land for the burial of Uthman ibn Mad'oon because it was an unoccupied parcel of land. It didn't have any construction on it, no buildings, no houses. And it was nearby the masjid as well. So the Prophet ﷺ, he ordered for Uthman ibn Mad'oon to be buried in Baqi'ah. And he is the first companion of the Prophet ﷺ who was buried in Baqi'ah. And after that, Baqi'ah became the graveyard of the Muslims. So anyone who would die in Al-Madinah, they were buried in Baqi'ah. Uthman ibn Mad'oon has the honor of being the first person who was buried there. And after him, any companion of the Prophet ﷺ who passed away in Al-Madinah, they were buried in Baqi'ah. Today, there are more than 10,000 companions of the Prophet ﷺ. More than 10,000 Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ who are buried in that piece of land in Baqiyah. And even today, 
anyone who dies in Al-Madina, they are buried in Baqiyah. Anyone who has the honor and the privilege of dying in Al-Madina, they are buried in that same graveyard in Baqiyah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to give us death in that place and to, to allow us to be buried in that place as well. What better place to be buried than Baqiyah? 10,000 companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are buried there. So what an honor that is. So Uthman ibn Mav'oon radiallahu an, he was the first one to be buried in Baqiyah. This companion, Uthman ibn Mav'oon radiallahu an, after he was died, after he died, his wife had a dream where she saw her husband, she saw Uthman, and underneath him there was a flowing river. So she went to the Prophet ﷺ and she informed him about this dream. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw my husband, I saw Uthman, and I saw under him, flowing beneath him was this river. So the Prophet ﷺ interpreted this dream for her. And he said to her, Thaka amalu. That river that you saw, that is his good deeds. That is his good deeds. So subhanallah, this is a glad tiding for this great companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Uthman ibn Mad'un. Also, from the incidents that took place in the year between the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Uhud was the expedition of Bani Sulaym. So the Prophet wasallam, he received intelligence that there were two powerful tribes, Bani Sulaym and Ghatafan, that were planning to attack al Madina, And they were making preparations for an attack on al Madina. So the Prophet wasallam, he decided to launch a surprise attack on them first. Before they could come to Medina, the Prophet wasallam wanted to surprise them and attack them first. And the Prophet wasallam prepared the Muslim army and they went out to confront Bani Sulaym. And Ali radiallahu anhu was the flag bearer of the Muslim army during that expedition. So when they came to Bani Sulaym, they were caught completely off guard. They had no idea that the Muslim army even knew that they were planning this attack. So they weren't even finished preparing. And the Prophet ﷺ and his army were there. So they confronted them with this surprise attack. So they were caught completely off guard. So they fled the scene. They ran away to the mountain tops. And they had to leave behind all of their camels. And they had 500 camels. And when they saw the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim army, they fled, they ran away, and they abandoned those camels. So the Prophet ﷺ and his army, they were able to take all of those camels and they took them back to al Madina, And that was the spoils of this expedition. 500 camels. So the Prophet ﷺ, he took one-fifth of those spoils for the Baytul Mal, for the Muslim treasury, and the remainder, he distributed all of these camels amongst these soldiers. So each one of them, there were 200 of them, so each one of them got two. After the Prophet ﷺ uh, kept aside one-fifth of these spoils, so one-fifth of 500 camels, it's 100. There were 400 remaining, and there were 200 soldiers, so each one of them, they got two camels from the spoils of uh, this expedition. So that happened also between the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Uhud. So these are some of the minor incidents that took place after the Battle of Badr, but before the Battle of Uhud. So many minor incidents that happened during uh, this year. The next major battle that took place was in Shawwal in the year 3 of Hijrah, and that is the Battle of Uhud. And inshallah, next week we will talk about what led to that battle, what were the precursors of that battle, and how that battle came about. Inshallah, we'll speak about that next week. Bi-idhnillah. Wallahu a'lam. Sallallahu wa sallam. Wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.